what I wanted to talk about tonight um, with you folks, and I'd like this to be a discussion uh, with you as well. I'd like to get input uh, from you all as well as part of this, is uh, how rock art can, <clears throat> how we can do research with rock art and really learn uh, from rock art, how we can move it ahead. Uh, and I want to focus on southern Arizona, that's uh, sort of for selfish reasons, that's where I've done most of my work, uh, and it's the area that I know best. And I'm going to give you some examples of, of uh, some recent studies and some things that have been done recently that uh, uh, will demonstrate and perhaps give some ideas to, uh, uh, to people about how how we can learn from rock art and what it can tell us. How many people here have not been to a Ho'okam rock art site? <laughs> well, that says, that says a lot right there. <laughs> How many of you have been to more than five rock art sites? Wow. <laughs> so there, there are a lot of people here who have seen a lot here in southern Arizona. Uh, and I'll look forward to, to some of your questions and comments. Um, let, me, let me start with something that's just a, uh, it's a little exercise to just, um, uh, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and just sort of think about it uh, as we talk about things. And this is going to put me to the test of my artistic skills. Uh, <laughs> I'm used to slides. Uh, so you're going to imagine that I'm drawing a mountain range here. And those are some canyons in case you can't tell. Uh, and let's, let's put a stream along here. Well, well, I'll put a spring here, so there's a little bit of it that's a stream. <laughs> and over here, I'm going to put a rock art site. And my question to you, this is a, <clears throat> oh, and let me specify the mountain range is a big mountain range. You know, we're talking like Galieros or something like that. And uh, so we've got this large rock art site that, wow, we found this big site. Uh, it's spectacular. Uh, we're looking at it and we're trying to decide what can we get out of this rock art site? What can we really learn from it? What's the most important things? That w what are the most important questions we can ask of this rock art site to learn from it? And how would we go about it? What would we have to do? Those are the two questions. So just sort of think about that. Um, and let, <clears throat> let me sort of start, uh, and lead into things here then, while well, you can move that over. Um, see, I'm trying to distract you while I go on. There. <laughs> um, there, there's been, historically sort of a disconnect between rock art enthusiasts and archaeologists. And I'm sure you're all aware of that. Um, archaeologists, um, and this is, this is true in many parts of the world, but it's especially true here in uh, the United States. Uh, and there's a variety of reasons for that. I mean, as, as both a member of the public and, and archaeologists, and, and based on what I hear people say, uh, rock art enthusiasts are out there for some really great reasons. Rock art is cool. It's really interesting. It's very exciting to walk around the uh, corner of a, a cliff face and see a big panel of rock art. It has an immediate sort of visceral feel to it. Uh, and as, as you know, the first question that pops to mind, what does this mean? Well, there's, art has an immediate effect on people. And that's, uh, uh, it's, it's 
a biological thing. Uh, it's uni art is universal. Uh, it has an effect on us emotionally and everybody does it in some way. Ellen DeSaniake, uh, somebody who studied this, uh, she says that art is making special. It's, it's a way that we sort of transform things to, to make them more than what they were. Um, so, so there's that innate interest uh, that we all have. There's other reasons why, why we like it. Okay, there's aesthetic reasons, which is sort of the same thing. Uh, we want to know what it means. We want to be able to, quote, read it. Uh, what about an archaeologist? Well, an archaeologist is going to look at that rock art and they're going to say, can I date it? Uh, well, maybe. Uh, it won't be easy. Um, the archaeologist may look at it and say, well, I know that I can't read it. Uh, and there's reasons why the archaeologist would say that. We're talking about uh, here in southern Arizona, I'm not talking about you know, Maya Stila, or something like that. The archaeologist might look at it and say, well, if I try and study that and write about it, I may sort of get branded as a rock art person. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I'm saying the harsh reality there. But really what I'm saying, this is more about what it was like 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And fortunately, things have changed a lot since then. Uh, now rock art is a major part of national meetings. It wasn't back then. Uh, there are many archaeologists that do study rock art. I'm one of them. Uh, I can be branded, that's OK. Um, but <clears throat> the archaeologist is most worried when he looks at rock art about, he looks at it differently. And it's because there are difficulties in studying rock art that have to be dealt with, overcome. What, <clears throat> so how do we take it from there? How do we make the archeologist happy and work with what the public and the rock art enthusiasts are most interested in. Because really, when it all comes down to it, we're all interested in what the, these things can tell us. The number one thing I'd like to put up uh, at the top here is context. And it's not, even though the first thing that a lot of people think of when they look at a rock art panel is, can I read it? What does it mean? That's the question I, I get most often from anyone that I go to a rock art site with is what does this mean on this panel? What does this symbol mean? Uh, well, there's reasons why for Ho'okam rock art and much rock art here in the Southwest, why I don't expect to ever be able to, quote, read it. It's not a written language here. It's not something where every time this symbol is used, it means X, or every time you see a spiral, it means there's water down below, or this symbol over here, it's a supernova. No, those things cannot be demonstrated. There's not evidence that we can use to say that. Uh, and this will go against, uh, some of you may have read some popular books out there that talk about the in direct interpretation of rock art designs. There's a number of books out there that tell you what, is sim what do the symbols mean in Native American art. Uh, well, there's not a universal language among however many hundreds of tribal groups over thousands of years. Um, that doesn't exist. So it's not that simple. But the answers are not depressing either. <laughs> this, it, we don't have to read it to get a lot out of it. And what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at some of the most exciting things that have, at least I think, have uh, uh, been 
being done in recent times here in uh, the southern southwest and add a few things of my own and just sort of demonstrate what I think we can, just as these examples can show, the sorts of things that we can get out of rock art and maybe some directions we can take. Um, one of the first uh, uh, one of the first things I'd like to talk about is a study that was done in uh, 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 this last decade in the South Mountains. Um, uh, doctoral student Aaron Wright uh, did a study of the South Mountains, uh, which are the, is the mountain range on the south side of Phoenix. And it's been known for a long, long time that there's a lot of rock art in that mountain range. There's uh, hundreds of uh, scattered sites. Most of the individual sites are not large, but there's, there's a lot when you put it all together. Now, of course, that's right next to uh, the largest population uh, center for the Ho'okam. Uh, uh, it's often called the core uh, for Ho'okam <laughs> studies. The rock art that's there is, is uh, 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 almost all, if not all, Ho'okam. There's no earlier component. Well, Aaron Wright was interested in, he didn't want to just record rock art. He wanted to look and he wanted to try and find out what its social context was, what the context was to the people who made it. And to do that, uh, his, his approach was to systematically survey a portion of the mountain range. And that, by survey, I don't mean just a regular archaeological survey where he records all the archaeological things. Uh, yes, he did that. But he also recorded aspects of the natural environment as well. He recorded places where there were natural seeps or springs. Uh, uh, he looked at uh, how uh, portions of the landscape were arranged relative to other portions, for example, rock outcrops or um, uh, uh, small rock shelters, little hills, that sort of thing. And he did. <clears throat> he did artifact recording at a more detailed level than most archaeological surveys would do. Uh, he wanted to know every potsherd and lithic flake and uh, stone tool that was up there. He wanted to get the full context of what was there. And by doing that, uh, he was able to get at some uh, uh, some things that others have not been able to in the past with the rock art there. Let me give you an example. One of the things he looked at was where the pottery was coming from because we're up in a mountain range here, you've got the rock art panels and there's small artifact scatters that are associated with um, uh, many of these little rock art sites up there. Well, the pottery can help tell you who was up there uh, if you know where it's from. And in fact, what he found out was that uh, almost all of the pottery there was tempered, um, uh, the, the plainware pottery, I should say, was tempered uh, with sands that came from south of the Salt River, in other words, right next to the mountain range. So it was the folks that were living along the canal systems um, adjacent to the mountains. They're the ones that were using the mountains the most. Um, he also found out that there, uh, I won't go into all the details, but he was able to pin down uh, things related to where stone tools were from, how they were being used, that sort of thing. Uh, he looked at, he, he wanted to tell whether rock art was used in special ways on the landscape. And he found out that there were you know, there, there were the usual relationships, you know, there's rock art along trails, uh, along points at the base of the mountains, that sort of thing. But he also found that the main, main association was with the seeps and springs up in the mountain there. Um, and I will say, uh, just so you know, this isn't a universal thing. Uh, you know, I've, I've done work in other areas 
This is a, a lot of what he found was special to the South Mountains. He found several areas where there were unusual things like uh, shrines where um, by shrine he was meaning things where uh, rocks were like placed in special ways intentionally. Uh, he also found uh, a little hill that had a summit trail. That's a path that's cleared that went right up to the top of the, the hill and there was rock art associated with it. And he considered how was this rock art used? What was the potential? Well he had the artifact scatters so he knew that people were bringing pottery and tools up there. He knew that some of the rock art was associated with just sort of mundane things like an agricultural field. And he also knew that it was associated with uh, something, that, that summit path, which is probably a ritual feature of some sort. Uh, and he looked at how many people could have viewed what was going on in those places. Um, and long story short, it helped him, whether he's right or not, sort of immaterial here, but uh, um, what he ended up with was that the rock art was being made in a ritual context and he, he viewed it as part of religion, essentially communal religion, folk religion if you will, because it's being practiced out, uh, out in a place away from the villages. And ultimately he was able to, because he, he with his he had a technique of uh, dating using a reflectometer, which uh, again, it's immaterial here whether he's actually, he did it in a way that'll be proven out in the end, but if his approach was, was accurate, he had a tool to look at uh, how Ho'okam religion and, uh, 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 changed from the pre-classic to the classic. It was great work. And it was not something that some of the people that had looked at the rock art there in the South Mountains had ever considered uh, before that because they didn't look at that full context of, of everything. And that's, that's what I'm going to hit on here is that you have to think about the whole context. And one of the, um, uh, I mean, one of the things I, I was thinking about as I was uh, thinking about doing this talk was, well, what if we looked at the rest of the Ho'okam uh, culture, the way that uh, rock art is often looked at. Rock art is often looked at sort of in isolation. Uh, I'm, I'm going to look at this rock art site and I'm going to study that, that site or that 10 sites over there without a whole lot of thought about w what its whole cultural context is. Well, what if we just looked at Ho'okam villages? That's all we ever looked at was just the villages. Well, we wouldn't know that they had big canal systems. We wouldn't know how everything was put together with those villages because we wouldn't have the full uh, settlement system. You can't just look at one thing is uh, the point. Well, another, <coughs> another thing, this is something that, that uh, I worked on, some of you probably know, know about. I was, I was doing a study up in the Tortolita Mountains. There was uh, uh, the Dove Mountain development. Uh, well, I was sort of involved from even before it was Dove Mountain. But uh, there's rock art sites in, in uh, the property that's owned uh, by that Dove, Dove Mountain uh, uh, development. And uh, I, w I recorded the rock art out there. And one, one of the things there I got to thinking of, uh, uh, there, was, there was a fair amount, there was one site that was all Western archaic rock art and there was another one that wasn't on the property but not far away that was too. And I was thinking about sort of the impact of, well, how did, how did these sites operate? How, how were they originally operating with, uh, in, in the place where they were? And what was their impact in the, for the people that came thereafter? And there's sort of two aspects to this that I wanted to hit on. One is rock art, you know, we look at places like, if, you, if you've been around southern Arizona, it sounds like many of you have to see the sites here. Uh, if you go to one of the really big sites, like maybe Gillespie Dam or, or one of 
there's any number of them I could name. Um, you look at a site like that and you think, wow, there is a lot of rock art here. Thousands and thousands of elements. Uh, you know, hundreds if not thousands of panels. Um, there were a lot of people making rock art. Well, so I, th I thought, well, why don't I just take a look at that and see how many people were making rock art. And so I had done a study in the Picachos quite a few years ago now, too many years ago, um, and uh, had recorded uh, uh, most of the sites there, not all of them, there's, there's a few others, but I, I, I just did a little modeling exercise and, and figured out how many petroglyphs there probably were in that mountain range, plus or minus, and then looked at how long a time span was involved. Uh, we had the data to do that. And you know what I found out? It sort of averages to about one petroglyph per year. Uh, that's not a lot of petroglyphs. Uh, and even, even when I looked at the shorter span of Ho'okam, because there's more Ho'okam uh, petroglyphs than there are Western archaic earlier stuff, it still came out to only a few, three, four uh, a year. Well, that, that was sort of a shocking thing to me when, when I did that. And so I thought, well, maybe that's just the way it is here. Maybe they just weren't making a lot here. So what about the Kosos? Well, anybody who's into rock art knows the Kosos. There's, you know, 20,000 petroglyphs in a canyon there. Well, you apply the same thing there. And, okay, yeah, if you average it over the, the lifespan of the people that were there, or the, uh, the occupation span, uh, if you will, or use span, I should say, there, um, it, that may not be accurate because maybe all the glyphs were made in a 10-year period. But if you do average it out, I got 14 petroglyphs per year there. Um, well, that, okay, so you could, if you compressed it down, maybe there were these bursts of rock art, and there's actually some indications that that was the case. But that still means that for long portions of prehistory, there was nobody making rock art. Um, and if you look at the historic uh, data on this, the most common answer that uh, uh, the people who asked, the, you know, and there were a whole range of historical figures who asked the locals, who, who pecked that? And the most common answer they got was, oh, the, the spirits did that, or, you know, the, the ghosts, or we don't know who did it. We don't. You know? And it was probably, I mean, it's more or less true. They didn't know. Most people wouldn't know somebody who'd made a, a, a petroglyph. So uh, that was one thing that really got me thinking, well, how, how does rock art really work in the culture then? Uh, if it's a rare occasion when it's made, what does it really mean? And should, should we really be paying this much attention to it? Well, the answer is yes, and, and the reason is because once you make it, it's there, and it's there, you know, thousands of years. So it has a totally disproportionate potential effect on culture uh, uh, to <clears throat> how rare it's made, I guess, is the way to say it. That was pretty awkward, but you get the idea. Uh, in rock art, there's a reservoir of design, basically, that's out there. Once it's made, those symbols are there on the rocks. The people 100 years after it's made, they may not know what the original intent was um, uh, who made the rock art. And in fact, there's a fair amount of evidence that individual rock art designs are individualistic. Uh, yes, there's... Uh, Every uh, society has um, their styles and design repertoire. But, uh, so, you know, everyone in this room would recognize 
the waves of a Coke can, for example. <laughs> Terrible example, but uh, for for rock art symbols, they're out there on the rocks for everyone to see, especially at the big uh, public sites, if you will. Uh, and it's it's similar. Uh, I had done a study of uh, uh, Ho'okam pottery, buffware, decorated pottery that's made up along the middle of Gila. And one of the things that, and I wasn't the first to notice this, but, was, but I noticed that there's like spans of time where certain um, uh, design elements would disappear. You wouldn't see them uh, 100 years or more. And then all of a sudden they're back on like the, the rim of a jar or something like that in a different setting. Where'd they go? What, what's, how did that stay in the culture? Well, of course, there's all the perishable aspects of culture that we don't get to see. There's baskets and clothes and so on. So it could be on there. Uh, but there's also the rock art. And I also found out that it was on these little special pots that you only find in ritual contexts, burials and special caches and stuff. So there are these sort of reservoirs, if you will, of design out there that cultures may have that it, it keeps the motifs in, in play in the culture, even though uh, uh, it's not there in any other form. So that's, that's several examples. I don't know how long I'm going here. There's a couple more. Um, um, I'm going to sneak a peek at my notes here. OK. Um, another, one other case, and I'll just do one other one, and then I, I want to uh, drop. I'm going to get back to this, and, uh, and I'm going to ask you some things. Uh, uh, actually, let's do this first. Now that you've all thought about this, <laughs> um, I, want, <clears throat> I want to ask, how should I, you know, what, what do I really need to do to walk over to that petroglyph site and get anything out of it? Um, shall I just go over there? Okay, one of the standard things to do is I'll go out there and I'll take a picture of every panel. Maybe I'll draw all the elements. I might even uh, record them digitally in some way. And I'll prepare a nice map. Well, is, is that adequate? Will I learn what it, <clears throat> well, of course, there's the, the question, what am I after? And that's, that's even higher up, you know, I was, I was hitting on context earlier, but really the thing is the question. Uh, what am I after? Um, if, if what I'm after is a photographic uh, document, that uh, a, a record of what's there, then my collection of photographs and the map, okay, well, that, that'll answer some of that. Uh, that'll, that'll be okay for that. But do I need to do something more if I'm interested in it archaeologically or just because I'm somebody who's really enthusiastic and want to get out there and uh, do things. Um, so I, I guess I'll leave that for whatever comments or questions then you might have afterwards. I wanted to uh, hit on that. And I want to close with uh, just a, uh, this one other study that really is, is quite interesting and I think it demonstrates how there can be unexpected things uh, that can come out of good documentation. Um, there's a, a group of local rock art enthusiasts who've been working, some of you may, may be here, my apologies if I can't see you because I'm blinded right now, um, <laughs> but uh, there's a group of local rock art enthusiasts who've been documenting uh, a large rock art complex in the Catalina, Santa Catalina Mountains, up in the CDO Valley. Well, 
they've been doing a great job of it. They've, they've documented trails, they've documented where the panels are, uh, we recorded other features and so on with it, uh, uh, habitation areas and so on. And uh, I don't think when they were working on it, they ever could have anticipated why that would end up being really important uh, for me as an archeologist working on a village uh, about, oh, maybe 10 miles away. Well, as it turned out, the village I was working on is called Honeybee Village. Uh, it's up in Oro Valley. You can actually, well, no, you can't yet, but someday if there's money with the county and Oro Valley and they work out uh, things between the two, there'll be a park there that you can go see because uh, a portion of the center of the site got preserved. But a portion of the site didn't get preserved and we excavated that. Uh, matter of fact, a very large portion of the site. And one of the things we found at that site was that uh, the Hohokam there were using uh, high elevation wood for building a lot of their houses. Uh, juniper, um, uh, pinon, ponderosa pine, corkbark, Cork bark fir, uh, some of the wood had to have come from very high up, probably up near Mount Lemmon. Um, so, <clears throat> and we're talking about a lot of logs. They were hauling logs down from the mount mountain. Uh, uh, individual house in some cases would have taken like 30 logs. Uh, um, and transport distance of uh, uh, 15 miles, 18 miles, something like that. Well, of course, I was interested in where did they go to get the wood. Uh, and so one, one of the students who was working uh, uh, with us uh, did her thesis on uh, taking a look at a, they call it least cost path, which is sort of a, a, a jargony way of just saying what's the most efficient route that you can take to get to whatever you're interested in, in this case, to the, that elevation where the wood is. Uh, and what she found out, and what I found out, because we were sort of working independently and looking at things slightly differently, we both came to the same conclusion of where that path had to be, and the path went right through that rock art site. Um, and so then they started wondering, well, maybe the rock art's there because of the path, or because of Maybe all of the communities in that area were using high elevation wood and everyone would get together there and go up the mountain or maybe there were people living there. There's all, all sorts of questions. I don't have time tonight to go into that. But it's just there's sort of an unintended consequence here uh, that if you can carefully record something, it may not always be the designs that give you what you want to know uh, with the rock art. It may be where they are, what their context is, and um, how they're arranged on the landscape, are there trails, and so on. And that's, that's the point I want to get across with that example. And I'm going to stop here because I shouldn't talk all night. I should let you guys uh, have your, your say too. And I'd, I'd love to uh, answer any questions or... or um, or whatever. So. Okay, um, before we get the question started, I just want to point out, there, if you don't feel like uh, asking the, your question um, on the, the microphone, there are pads and pens and, and papers on all the tables. Feel free to write a question down, and if, as I'm running around, if you'll have somebody pass me the question, I'll, I'll answer it uh, when we can get to it. And I believe our first question starts over here. So I think I'm going to have uh, some help passing the microphone. I, um, that the most recent site you're talking about is that the one off the Baby Jesus Trail up in? Yes. Okay. Can you hike to that, or, or you can't? Is it off a trail uh, or a? It's, a Jeep? it's not a. It's not a. Uh, actually, the access to it is fairly restricted because you have to go through private land. Uh, Next question. Okay, head back this way. You make a good point about context. 
Is there a time when you would predict or expect that the symbols themselves might jump out at you and be very meaningful across, say, a horizon of things? Are there some universal symbols? Um, great question. I don't think there are any universal symbols. There are universal designs um, that occur uh, all across the world. And some of those are probably just because they're biologically innate uh, in us. There's a variety of studies that show that there's a sort of a range of symbols that we just create in our brains. Uh, but the, the answer is a little complicated. Yes, I think we can interpret what some things are, uh, but it doesn't say what necessarily what they mean. And by that, let me give you an example. Um, there's that, which at least for me when I grew up, that meant a bird. Uh, if, well, it's an ugly one, but... <laughs> <laughs> But due to some rock art uh, panels that were very informative, I'm almost certain that means sheep. Uh, uh, it's the horns of a sheep look head on, basically. And it's just, you know, and this, this is one of the problems we have, you know, if you hear somebody saying, well, I know what that means, you really got a question because we don't have the same worldview. Uh, as these people, and, and it gets, and it's even, uh, I don't want to go too far into it, but you know, like Ellen Desaniake I mentioned, who's been studying art, our culture doesn't have even the same view of art as most of the world. Uh, there, there are, uh, uh, we have to be suspicious of that, that we can actually put our minds into it. So, and you have to find the supporting evidence, and which I think is what you're getting at. Yes, in certain situations, well, of course, if you see a drawing of a sheep, it's a sheep. But the problem is, what, what does it mean in the culture? And, um, and more specifically, you're really asking, what did it mean to the person who made it? And that's, that I don't think we're going to get at. I don't, I don't because... Often people who, um, um, for example, if you, you talk to, um, well, there's a range of studies around the world where uh, people have been interviewed who are, are making drawings of one sort or another. Uh, if they actually have a conscious intent of telling a story or something like that, it's often very individualistic and it's, and it's put in metaphor. It's not a direct thing. A sheep doesn't mean a sheep. A sheep might mean there's going to be rain this year or whatever. <laughs> That's a very simplistic way of saying it. But I do think that we can, there's some abstract designs that we may find out really aren't abstract. As a matter of fact, there was somebody, um, our ceramic analyst at the office where I worked in Haiki, he came to me this morning and said, you know, I never really noticed this, but uh, um, that, which you <coughs> generally gets called Z's, uh, they're, they're a very common motif on, on pottery that dates to the thousands around here. Um, well, if you put two of them together, a circle there and a line out there, it's the sort of dancing uh, oh, come people. Um, well, maybe those Zs are the legs, you know? Maybe they stand for people. We don't know, but it, it's just an example of uh, that sort of context. Does that answer your question? Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, back here just a sec. Well, there's one symbol that occurs to me might be more or less universal because I know it does appear in various places around the world, and that's the vulva symbol, which would be mm -hmm. um, reproductive or increasing population type uh, 
Can you comment on that? What do you want me to say about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you you indicated that there weren't really any universal symbols, and oh, oh no, I would say are. that that might qualify as a universal symbol. There are universal designs, I should say. It's just that the meaning of those designs varies. And, and the way people represent things like, like uh, a vulva shape uh, vary in different places. Uh, and maybe there is, I, I don't know, I haven't studied in depth cross-culturally so that may be one that is, and that may be an exception, but I couldn't, I couldn't address that because I don't know. Okay, a question here? Yes, is, is there a, um, a way to date rock art? Uh, there are a number of techniques that uh, have been used. Um, there's no one technique that works in every place, and uh, a fair number of techniques right now are, are still considered experimental, or at least I consider them experimental. Um, the <clears throat> and there's, there's some techniques that are definitely not very good. Um, perhaps the, the best ones, uh, or, or the easiest way to do it as an archaeologist, is if you can find certain symbology that you know dates to a certain time period because you have the pottery designs or whatever, cross-dating basically. Uh, but in terms of absolute dating, dating where you're actually getting a date directly from the rock, uh, if we're talking about petroglyphs. With pictographs it's different. You, sometimes if they have an organic binder you can actually date it through radiocarbon uh, dating. Uh, but petroglyphs is another story. Now there's been, uh, Ron Dorn developed a technique a fair number of years ago to use uh, radiocarbon dating for petroglyphs as well. He was dating organic material that was uh, caught up in the, uh, the rock varnish. That's, that's been uh, discounted. He, he retracted it. Um, it. It just, because you don't know where the, the organic material came from, uh, there's too many possibilities for what the date ranges could be. Um, there's, there's some other techniques. There's a technique called VML dating that has to do with uh, how rock, var rock varnish uh, has formed over different climatic regimes. And that has some promise. Uh, I don't think it's fully demonstrated yet. Uh, and it's not like a really precise technique. It, it can have pretty, pretty wide uh, margin of error. Likewise, there's a technique, uh, this was also Ron Dorn that developed this, uh, it's called cation ratio dating that um, uh, looks at how uh, the varnish itself um, uh, that, can, that forms over time, what its um, cation, well, it's, it's a long involved explanation, but it looks at it directly, and there's, there's some pretty, it, it's a pretty crude technique, but uh, I, I think it's fairly widely accepted that uh, uh, at a gross level, it works. Um, there's some other much more experimental approaches that haven't been demonstrated. The, the work I've done, like in the Picachos, we looked at the actual mineralogy and how varnish formed. Uh, uh, and I think we had at least a reasonable relative tool with that, but it's pretty crude. Um, so. Okay, I think we had one more question over here. Or I've got a stack of questions. Um, I'll just go ahead. Could you talk a little bit about the ubiquity of the spiral symbol? Um, it seems like spirals are everywhere, and mm -hmm. some people would like to know a little bit more about why. Spirals are one of those designs that are biologically innate in us. Um, if um, maybe I should give some background on this, the uh, there's a range of symbols that 
there's folks who have, this, this comes out of an unusual body of literature in psychology um, and anthropology. Um, if you ingest certain drugs like LSD, you will see things. <laughs> and and uh, those things have been documented. Uh, Spiral is one of them. Uh, lots of little dots. Uh, that's another. There's, there's a whole range of these things. Uh, and there's folks who've studied in, in cultures that, that regularly ingest hallucinogens of one sort or another. This, this especially applies to uh, some Amazonian group. Um, those same symbols have been documented. Now, there's this huge sort of controversy out there in the literature related to shamanism and rock art. And as, as these designs, which, which are called either phosphenes or entoptic designs, because they're, um, they're things that we can see. And I, I've learned, actually, that not everyone can do this, which makes me feel rather isolated. But, but, <laughs> but if you close your eyes you know, and press your eyeballs, you can see some of these things. Uh, so you don't have to take hallucinogens to see some of it, anyway. So I'm, and I, and I, I didn't take LSD. <laughs> so for whatever reason, anyway, some people can see these things. Migraine sufferers can. Uh, it's, they're, they're universally part of our psyche. Uh, there's also people who have studied uh, children cross-culturally. Uh, there's a great study by Kellogg. I'm not absolutely convinced on uh, those studies because there's, there's some things I'm not comfortable with on them. But there is one thing about them, and that's they, uh, little kids, they draw these things. Um, and you may find even if you go back and look at the doodles around your papers or something, you may find some of these things. Of course, you know, as an adult, we've been ingrained with, we're bombarded in this culture with, with graphic design, so it's not exactly a fair test, but there is good reason to think that spirals are one of those universal ones, and they're used, I think, in a lot of ways by different cultures prehistorically, and I don't think they universally mean the same thing. Uh, I found that dropping a large matate on your foot will generate some other interesting... There you go. <laughs> I, I see sunbursts with that. <laughs> um, could you speak a little bit about the technology involved with creating a, a, a piece of rock art? Um, is, are there sort of standardized tools? How long does it take to make a, a decent-sized glyph? Yeah, there's, there's been some good studies with that. I've, I've played around with it myself because I figured I, I should know. Um, it's really hard on your hand. <laughs> um, Ho'okam rock art, and this, this of course is different in different uh, uh, times and places in the southwest or around the world because rock art, can, petroglyphs can be made in different ways. It can be in direct percussion or it can be direct and so on. Ho'okam, most of it is direct percussion with, with a, a rock. Uh, and most of the tools that they use are they're nothing fancy. Uh, you wouldn't notice them if you re weren't really looking and knowing what to look for. Um, they are sometimes brought from a distance away into the sites. Um, that was one thing that uh, that Aaron Wright study in the South Mountains. He he did a good job of documenting uh, uh, the tools, uh, um, and I've I've seen them at many sites. They they often get left. Uh, on the sites because, because they aren't anything special. But the fact that they do bring rocks in to do them means that there was intent uh, to make the rock art from some other place in time. And that's, that, that's, that's certainly interesting. These, these things aren't, you know, one of the things that um, I also often get asked about is what, what are the, are the, isn't this just graffiti? Because you know everybody makes graffiti. Well, no, it's not. There, there's intent, and I firmly believe they're usually made in a ritual context, and that's one of the reasons. I think we have a question over here. 
Henry, I want to go back to your big question about what am I, what am I after? Mm -hmm. And I think the reason that I've always uh, been studying rock art has to do with trying to get a glimpse into the cosmology or the thought process of these people. And from what you've said tonight, that sounds like maybe a sort of hopeless case. And I wonder if you could expand on that. Well, that's depressing. I, <laughs> I didn't realize I gave that impression. Um, no, I don't think it's hopeless to get at some of these things. Um, I don't think we have to know what each symbol means uh, um, to understand things like, well, I don't think we're ever going to get at the details of Ho'okam religion, for example, the way that we know religion in our culture. But I think we can get at some general ideas of how it may have functioned and, um, and sort of anthropologically speaking, how it was used in, the, in culture. And the rock art can help with that. Uh, if you get to the point where you believe that rock art is made in a ritual context, that it has religious significance, that's a starting point to work from to learn even more when you start looking at uh, 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 its context in the culture. And I don't think we've even begun on things like, like that. I think uh, uh, that study of the South Mountains was really important for that. I think some other studies have been done elsewhere. I mean, I haven't talked about work in other parts of the country or around the world. There's, there's a lot of good work that's being done right now. And uh, uh, No, I, I think we can get at some of those things. And we have a question, a couple of questions here. We've got a bunch of questions tonight, so please bear with me. Henry, if you could maybe just restrict this to Hoacom or Southern Arizona. Do you have a sense that rock art is made by many people or by a few people, maybe special people? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, Aaron Wright's study does a really good job of demonstrating it's many people. Um, it's, it's an individualistic pursuit. Now, there certainly are places uh, where you can say, I think all of these were made by the same person. But those, those localities are not common, uh, and or I, they're, not, they're not the average, is the, I guess the way, way to say it. Uh, now, he was working with a setting that's different from uh, a lot of the sites that uh, probably a, a lot of us have seen. He wasn't working with these, you know, the big site at the base of the mountain. He was working with a whole range of sites that were scattered up in this uh, canyon area in the high, and in, up in the highlands, uh, the South Mountains. And so there were lots of separate localities related to different things. Uh, on one of these big sites like, uh, oh, I mean, even a site like Signal Hill, uh, um, the, <coughs> you get that question, uh, well, and if you look at it closely, if you really start documenting them, and I, I th I'm sure there's a number of people here who have, have been down at that level drawing designs and so on, you'll see different pecking patterns and, and uh, uh, different concern with how the design is drawn and, and so on that, that leads me to think that uh, there's lots of people that were involved. Now, Lots is a very relative term, given what I told you earlier about how many of these things are made. But, but that's the other reason why you would think that it was lots of different people. I don't think it was, it wasn't like one guy that went out there and each year for the 30 years he lived, he put one design. We have a question um, that sort of dovetails into that. Um, can you tell if uh, a rock art or a particular glyph has been added to or modified through time? Like somebody carves a glyph mm -hmm. and then can you tell that someone else has come up and modified it? If, if they modified it after a span of time, uh, where a sufficient span of time where the mineralogy has a chance to, um, well, let me back up. When you peck a design initially in the rock and it, you peck through, you, most rock art is pecked on rocks that have a surface patina, sometimes rock varnish. Um, which means the rock has been chemically and mechanically weathered and it's had, 
it's got this varnish formation, which is a long process that uh, don't need to go into. But as soon as you peck through that, it opens up those minerals to oxidation, to uh, mineralogical changes that are chemical and mechanical. And, you know, if the long enough span of time, you'll get the varnish formation again. And so if somebody comes in a fair, a long enough time, which like up in the Picacho Mountains, that span of time was probably a hundred years, maybe several hundred years. Uh, that was long enough for there to be visible change. And yes, you can tell. And like in the Picacho Mountains, we, we had a fair number of panels that had been repacked. Uh, somebody had gone in, most of it was done late. Uh, I, I think it was proto-historic uh, times when, you know, sort of Kino time period or before. Um, Very interesting. Okay, we have a question here. Yeah. Um, I've noticed uh, relationships between the springs as you and uh, different areas with petroglyphs, but I've also mm -hmm. seen signs like there'll be an owl at one place with a bunch of petroglyphs near a stream, and then if I go somewhere else, I'm finding maybe a bear hand. Um, would there be anything correlating to different villages along a trail? Like they're finding in Australia, the Aborigines have, have started laying out trails with their paintings. Um, would that be something that would be a possibility of you're entering the village of Bear Country or whatever, and um, then what can be found around that area? Say good hunting mm -hmm. or? Um, that's been looked at, there's um, uh, in many places in the world, uh, essentially um, the way archaeologists have approached it is uh, as boundary markers, essentially, uh, although it can mean other things as well, as you, as you mentioned. Um, and those sorts of things do definitely occur in some places in the world. I have yet to see it for Ho'okam. Um, there, there's no reason why because I can't interpret the symbols at this point, I, I, I don't have a way to clue into it right now. That doesn't mean that we won't be able to. There may be clues that we can use by mapping where every one of those panels are. Uh, you may find out that there's some sort of a pattern related to um, a community or a set of communities. At the present time, nothing like that has shown up, but uh, I wouldn't doubt that it could. There is a, uh, there's one case I know where uh, there's a drainage, uh, actually two cases, where there's a drainage that's sort of the main pathway that one would take uh, to go into a mountain pass uh, where there's a rock art site. And in those two cases, there's a particular design that's repeated all along that route and shows up at the site as well. I don't, you know, does that mean, okay, you're on the path to this special place? Or, you know, it certainly, it has that feel to it, whether that's the right way to look at it or not, I don't know. Henry, would you talk a little bit about pictographs versus petroglyphs in this area? Uh, well, I don't have much to say about pictographs because they're so rare here. Uh, there are some. Uh, Hoke, there's very few cases of what I think are Hoke-Com uh, pictographs. There's, there's a few very rare cases. Um, uh, I'm not sure what to say about them because there's not that many. I mean, they, of course, they're only preserved in, in special environments, uh, shelters, caves. Uh, some people uh, have wondered whether petroglyphs were painted at some point. Uh, um, I know the early, there's an early uh, Spanish account. I, there's painted rocks if you've been out there. Well, the name came because people thought that they were painted. Well, um, there's no evidence that, that that was the case, and I have looked for the evidence that would be. Sometimes there are pictographs where you wouldn't necessarily expect them. I found a pictograph panel up in the Picachos that I just never would have believed was there. 
but it took working on the site for, oh, I'd probably been out there 20 days with, with another person at the point, and we were sitting there eating lunch at a place that we'd been many times before we saw it. <laughs> so, um, there, there probably are other cases like that out there. I'm sure that wasn't alone, but there, there's just not very many. And I'm, I'm, I'm sort of convinced that there never was for Ho'okam because there's plenty of opportunities in some of these settings for there to have been preserved ones and they're just not there. Okay, we have another question here. Um, I, I've heard some, well there were two things uh, in terms of context that I'm wondering about. One is acoustics mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and there is, there has, has been some work on acoustics in terms of ritual um, mm -hmm. places, but um, I haven't seen that much here. And it seems to me things like rocks with cupules in them um, mm -hmm. that could be used as rock gongs um, might be acoustically connected mm -hmm. to, to uh, petroglyphs. And the other thing is gender. Um, mm -hmm. I know that Nieves Sedeño has, has mentioned that some rock art sites, sites seem to be female places uh, as opposed to male places. And she, you know, has gotten to that point by using ethno-archaeology, by talking mm -hmm. to uh, informants um, in, in uh, you know, present-day uh, mm -hmm. groups. Um, well, if, for the first question, uh, acoustics, yeah, there's been some interesting work done. Uh, like you say, the best evidence for that actually is elsewhere. Um, I mean, some of those great Utah canyons are the best example of that, where you've got a nice, you know, uh, shaped enclosure where if you stand in a certain place, you can hear exactly, uh, you know, the other side of the wash or something. Uh, there's a great case in the lower Pecos like that, too, where you can stand in a shelter where the rock art is, and you can be in the shelter. Uh, way across the canyon and hear it as if you were right there. Um, I've not seen anything like that uh, here, but there are, uh, you also mentioned the, the cupules, and um, uh, I've heard those called lots of different things, the rocks that um, if you whack it, it makes a chiming uh, sound. Um, those definitely occur on Ho'okam sites, and they occur, they were used all through prehistory here because there's Western archaic ones as well as Ho'okam used ones. Um, don't go out pecking the rocks to see where they make the sound. Um, unfortunately, there's a couple of sites where people have found out and they're getting just really hammered, so to speak. Um, um, you can actually you know, you can hit it with your knuckle if you're careful, and you can tell that these rocks have this wonderful sound. Um, and it's loud enough that um, if somebody was actually hitting them unobstructed with a rock, it would be very loud. You could have, you know, basically a whole performance, you know, you could have people down there that could be listening to this. There was, there was somebody back a number of years ago when these were first getting recognized that went out with a covered mallet and made a tape of music uh, using one of those things. Um, really quite dramatic. They're not that common, though. There's some sites that have a number of them and many sites that have none of them. Um, and as, as, as far as, remind Gender. me again. I'm sorry, what? Gender. Gender. Um, I guess I can't address that. I haven't, I haven't seen anything that would tell me in, in my own work or read uh, for OCOM work that has done a really good job of addressing that. There's, there's some, you end up sort of stereotype talking about it. Um, there's like, like one of the big sites in the Picachos. Well, it's, it's out on an area where uh, you might be out in a hunting area or something like that. Well, so is it, so is it male? Well, I don't, I don't know. Uh, there's, there is a reasonable, 
guess that there may be uh, uh, a different subset of the population that's using these sites than what's typical in the village and that it might be uh, more restricted gender-wise. There's, there's certainly an ethnographic argument you could make for that. Um, and, and that sort of brings up actually one, one other thing. It's, I think it's actually more important who used these sites than who made them. Um, it's, it's, it's that disproportionate effect of art because um, a whole lot more people like, like one of the biggest sites in the Picachos um, that I worked on, it's, it's just an ideal place to do performances of some sort uh, and have an audience down below you. Uh, and there's a lot of sites like that. Uh, and that's one of the ones that has, has the, the rocks that you can ring. Um, but gender, I'm less sure. Okay, if we could quickly take a step back. Um, we forgot to mention, um, what's the difference between a petroglyph and a pictograph? Sorry. <laughs> Pictographs are painted, petroglyphs are pecked, uh, or hammered. Or scratched. Or scratched, yes. Yeah, yeah, we can go through. So somehow the rock surface is removed, uh, put it that way, for petroglyphs. Uh, I have a quick question. I'm a neophyte naive at this, so if it's uh, stupid, just say so. And, and I'll give you a better grade. Uh, <laughs> no, you're doing great. It's very good. I'm, I'm sorry to be so pleased. Um, you mentioned the terms Western archaic style in Hohokam. Mm -hmm. You seem to know that. So are the symbols different or, or, okay. or what? Could you help us there, thanks? Sure. Um, uh, there's the oldest um, uh, rock art that's out here is Western archaic. It can get, it gets called various things um, uh, here in the Western US, but it's an underlying stratum of, of design that's um, most of the design is geometric uh, and it's, it's often very well pecked or abraded. Uh, it covers rock surfaces and often goes around the corners of rock surfaces. Um, here in southern Arizona, um, western archaic sites have slightly different settings than Hoakam sites. They, they cross one another and they're sometimes on the same site, but they have slightly different distributions. The sets of designs, those geometric designs that are in Western Archaic continue after, uh, once the Hoakam culture develops, they continue in the Hoakam culture. They don't disappear. It's just that um, uh, like the specific ways that they're used get changed Sometimes uh, their specific uh, elements change a little bit, like rakes become, they were usually curved, they become straight back, things like that. The Hoakam rock art here, which is also called Gila style, uh, um, there's life forms are abundant, uh, people are depicted in it, stick figures, uh, lots of zoomorphs. And then there's all the geometric stuff too, and there's a whole range of like specific uh, stylistic components. But uh, uh, the Western archaic stuff is is similar. There's versions of that uh, that get called different things, and it's it's all over the world. Uh, and that's because it's primarily composed of those, um, or, or at least partly composed of those motifs that are biologically innate in us. Uh, what would rock art look like right after it was made? Well, I suppose it depends on the rock that uh, is involved, but right when you first pound rock, and I, I guess I didn't get at that, there was a previous question about experimental, uh, how long does it take to make a design element, but uh, when you first peck, uh, actually almost everything from basalt to sandstone, uh, the rock surfaces, it's powdered, and it looks really whitish. Uh, it really stands out. 
Uh, so a fresh rock art panel, one that's just been pecked, is very bright and uh, highly visible. And you know, over time, of course, that uh, ultimately it's going to end up looking like the, the background of the rock if you give it enough time. But uh, that's the case. Um, and following on that, uh, I was asked, uh, uh, how long does it take to make a design? You can make a small, fairly well-pecked geometric design, something not very big and not very complicated, 15 minutes to half an hour. The more complicated, bigger compositions were talking, you know, hours, uh, and a very, for me, a sore hand. Uh, but I think they were a little tougher. Uh, <laughs> or maybe they put leather around their hand or something. I don't know. I was stupid the first time I did it. Uh, okay. Next one. Check. Okay. Um, I guess that does it for us tonight. Um, an exceptionally good set of questions. Thank you all. Thank you, Henry. Yeah. Thank. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.